I, I guess this means we're live. Um, good afternoon, or I should say good evening. It is evening in Vienna, I'm coming to you from Vienna. My name is uh, Dr. Alexander Carpenter, and I'm the director of the Worth Institute for Austrian and Central European Studies at the University of Alberta. The Worth Institute is one of a network of seven international Austrian centers supported in part by the Austrian government. It's the only such institute in Canada with a mandate to promote both the multidisciplinary study of Austria and Central Europe, but also to celebrate its culture and to facilitate the exchange of um, students and faculty in the uh, spirit of global knowledge transfer and the building of scholarly networks. And we are very pleased and proud to present today's talk by uh, Ella, uh, Ella, excuse me, Ella uh, Shubailo. Uh, it's the mission of the Institute to host scholarly events such as this, but it is especially exciting when a talk highlights intersections between scholarly, political, and public discourse, and when it's uh, interdisciplinary in nature, so touching on a wide range of uh, potential subject areas and issues uh, like art and art censorship, LGBTQ activism and rights, and uh, politics in Central Europe. Um, maybe it goes without saying, today's presentation is uh, perhaps a, a bit controversial. I'll just remind our audience if it's necessary. This is a scholarly event and its purpose is a disinterested investigation of a contemporary issue, uh, ideally followed by a respectful discussion in which a variety of uh, considered viewpoints and ideas can fruitfully circulate and I'll look forward to that. My colleague, Dr. Terry Tomsky, will introduce our speaker and will serve as moderator for the discussion uh, following the talk. Dr. Tomsky is an Associate Professor of English and the Chair of the Worth Institute's Academic Advisory Board. Um, I'll just conclude these, these brief opening remarks with a, a reflection of where I am right now. I'm, you can't really see, I'm sitting in the historical home of the Viennese modernist composer Arnold Schoenberg. Um, and I mentioned that only because Schoenberg's music was uh, itself considered sort of rather uh, blasphemous in the early 20th century, but his circle also included um, controversial artists, um, Klimt and Egon Schiele, and maybe especially Oskar Kokoschka, who were expelled from their institutions and even jailed for making art that was considered obscene and that violated social norms. So from the historical heartland of art, that pushed the boundaries of uh, taste and probity. Uh, I thank you on behalf of the Worth Institute for attending today's talk. And I will turn the camera over to Dr. Tomsky. Hi everybody, and welcome to the talk today. My name is Terry Tomsky and I'll be moderating this lecture. So I'm an associate professor in the Department of English and Film Studies at the University of Alberta, as well as the chair of the Worth Academic Advisory Board. And before we begin, I just want to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from Territory 6, uh, Treaty 6 Territory, the traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous people um, in, uh, whose histories, languages and cultures continue to influence our vibrant communities. And it is a special pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today. And that's not just because she is an alumna of the University of Alberta. So Dr. Ella Pishbiwa, is an assistant professor in English and women's gender and sexuality studies at Illinois State University in the United States. She has a very impressive roster of publications, including numerous academic articles that reveal her wide ranging engagement with queer and sexuality studies, politics, aesthetics, media, creative writing, film and digital publishing, to name just a few. On top of this, she also has a book monograph published in 2019 titled Asexual Erotics, Intimate Readings of Compulsory Sexuality. She is also the editor of a second book, a volume titled On the Politics of Ugliness. And in addition to all of this, she's also co-edited several special issues of academic journals on topics like the representations of hysteria, the aesthetics of transnational descent, and interdisciplinary approaches to scholarship on asexuality. So as we will see today, Dr. Pishboa's work explores the motivations behind homophobia and transphobia in Poland with a focus on building queer and feminist genealogies of resistance. 
Dr. Bishwiwa's talk today is entitled Rainbow Mary and the Perceived Threat of LGBTQ Plus Bodies in Poland. And before we begin, I want to clarify the logistics of today's event. So Dr. Pishbuo will speak for about 30 minutes, followed by a question and answer period. The chat will be disabled for the duration of the talk. However, in the Q&A period, you can ask your questions by typing them into the Q&A window, which you can find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. As moderator, I will be fielding the questions. And as well, I want to remind you all that the University of Alberta is a place of robust debate and open inquiry. It is not a place where we debate someone's humanity or the terms of their self-reference. And I draw the line when the environment or debate become hostile. We don't tolerate harassment here or ad hominem attacks. The Worth Institute seeks to create a hospitable space and to cultivate an inclusive environment that fosters respect for human dignity and supports all members of our diverse community to learn and discover. And in the spirit of mutual respect and civility, we welcome all your questions. Thank you. And since we're not in person and cannot collectively welcome our speaker with applause, I will applaud on your behalf as I turn the microphone over to her. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank Pishpilo. You. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I'm just gonna take a second to share my screen before I get started. So hopefully that is visible. Um, first, I just wanted to give a few thank yous. Um, thank you to Sylvia Hrobach who invited me to do this talk to Rochelle Wright for getting everything set up, Terry Tomsky for moderating and for that wonderful introduction, and Alexandra Carpenter, the chair of the Worth Institute, again, for that wonderful introduction. Also, shout out to my sister, Eva, who is in the audience. I want to say it is an honor for me to do this talk at the Worth Institute. Um, as was mentioned, I am originally from Edmonton, um, and I did both my undergrads and my MA at the University of Alberta. And I also had the privilege to take Polish language and culture classes with Professor Wacław Osadnik and Dr. Elżbieta Ostrowska. And I remember those very fondly. Um, a little bit about me. I was born in Wrocław and with my family, we, we immigrated in the late eighties through the solidar solidarity wave of immigration to Edmonton. So I write from a diasporic Polish perspective um, based in Edmonton. I'm not actually able to participate <clears throat> excuse me, other than through online digital means and many of the protests that have been taking place in Poland that I'll, I'll discuss. Um, but I still believe that as a diasporic Polish person and as a queer person, um, I sort of have things I can think about in relation to these movements. I also want to mention that some of the work I'll share today um, was published in an issue of the journal Digital Icons in a special issue that was edited by Cassandra Hartblay and Tatiana Klepikova. So I'm going to read a paper and share slides with you. So the Black Madonna of Częstochowa, Matka, Matka Boska Częstochowska, and let me just get to this painting, there you go, is a Byzantine painting of unprecedented importance for Polish sovereignty. It features a Black Mother Mary clad in a head covering, holding in her arms a Black baby Jesus, both of whom are encircled by golden halos. Mary's right cheek is slashed with two vertical and one horizontal mark, legends attributing these to Hussite invasion in 1430. Located at Jasna Gura Monastery in Częstochowa, the painting epitomizes the cult of Mother Mary in Polish culture, even while its origins remain undetermined. As far as symbols go, the painting's importance for Poland is almost of unparalleled importance symbolizing Polish sacrifice, survival, Catholicism, and devotion to matriarchal symbology. Pilgrimages numbering in the millions are held to Częstochowa annually to view the painting. It should thus be a perhaps no surprise that the remaking of the Black Madonna of Częstochowa into a queer icon by Elżbieta Podleśna was immediately contested within Poland. In 2019, Podleśna substituted the golden halos on both Mary and Jesus with six colored stripes from the pride rainbow, placing Polish veneration, survivance, and patriotism in direct contact with Polish queerness and LGBTQ struggle. As at least one news source humorously named her, Matka Boska Tymczochowska, or Our Mother of Rainbows, appeared in 2019 Pride Parade in Częstochowa, and Podleśna displayed the imagery throughout Płock via postering and stickering with the help of activist Anna Prus and Joanna Gzyra Iskander. So I'll keep on returning to this image of, um, 
of the Rainbow Mary, but I also just want to um, go to a few other slides. The postering action was intended to challenge Easter celebrations in the Catholic, Catholic St. Maximilian Kolbe Parish at the Church of St. Dominique, which you'll see an image from here, that unequivocally frame both LGBTQ people and gender as sinful, along with other sins, including, as you'll see written on these boxes beneath the cross, hatred, lies, and gossip, and so-called hate, H-E-J-T. Speaking to her political postering action, Podleshna indicated that nobody should be excluded from society. Sexual orientation is not a sin or a crime, and the Holy Mother would protect such people from the church and from priests who think that it is okay to condemn others. Yet despite Rainbow Mary's prominence, Podleshna was arrested in May of 2019, along with the two other activists, facing up to two years in prison for offending religious feelings, which is a blasphemy law in Poland housed under Article 196 of the Penal Code. As many activists on social media have pointed out, Podleśna's art has been unfairly targeted since there have historically been countless Catholic instances of paintings of Mother Mary decorated with rainbows and rainbow halos in Poland. And I really love this meme here um, from feminist politician Agata Martyna Diduszko Zyglewska's page on Instagram, which basically has the Hail Mary prayer superimposed over rainbow based Catholic icons and devotional images with the words, not you, over Podleśna's Rainbow Mary art piece. So the idea that everyone is included except for queer people. While Podleśna's powerful protest art was confronted with hatred and accusations of profanation, Podleśna herself toggled Catholicism and feminist and queer values, eschewing the too easy homophobic interpretation that remaking a Polish symbol on queer terms somehow sullies its value and meaning. Podleśna is one of many important feminist activists in Poland. At the same time, Podleśna is also a secular Catholic, clearly invested in Polishness as much as in queerness, religiosity alongside feminism. Podleśna's powerful Rainbow Mary asks Polish people to reassess their homophobic and transphobic panic and to turn to their patriotism and religiosity as a source of LGBTQ acceptance. Indeed, the Polish symbol strikes me for its ability to hold together rather than split apart right-leaning commitments to Polish sovereignty and the religious grounding that has historically been important to Polish survivors, with what have been understood as left-leaning commitments to protecting the lives of LGBTQ people in Poland. In other words, Rainbow Mary, while a symbol despised by the right, provides possibilities for LGBTQ people in Poland to continue to be proud of their Polishness and religiosity, while also being proud of their sexual and gender identities. On March 3rd, 2021, a Polish court in Płock acquitted Podleśna as well as the two other activists of all charges. Echoing Podleśna's framing, the judge offered the following statement. The goal of the activists was to support LGBTQ people. There is no provision in the catechism of the Catholic Church that excludes non-heteronormative persons. There is love, mutual respect and understanding. While ending well for Podleśna and providing a landmark case in Poland, in defense of LGBTQ activisms, Rainbow Mary's travels and the homophobic and transphobic responses that the art piece elicited invite analyses of why and how Polish histories of struggle have been weaponized in hateful ways as so often, especially in recent years, which is what I'll talk about today. Recent years have seen mounting hatred against LGBTQ people within Poland. And I'll mention a few examples the rise of concept, the conceptual right-wing framework of gender ideology, efforts to create LGBT-free zones, and attempts at preventing, preventing pride parades known as equality marshes, marches or Marsze Równości in Poland, all point to ways in which Polish nationalism has been set into play. The formulation of gender ideology in Polish ideologia gender or genderism by the right wing is a catch-all to describe anything to do with feminist, queer, or transgender approaches to gender. The use of gender ideology in similar terms is a transnational trend cropping up in many post-state socialist countries, Poland, Russia, Ukraine, Slovakia, Georgia, Hungary, as well as many Western countries, including France, Germany, and the US, to name just a few, and as part of a right-wing populism, as Lydia Salvatore discusses. 
the hateful framing of all efforts at gender equality and sexual justice as gender ideology has been active in the Polish public sphere since at least 2013 and highly influenced by Polish ties to Catholicism and the Vatican. In the Polish context, the motivation behind this ideological framework is the protection of children from so-called new ideas around gender and sexuality, which are seen as Western imports that threaten Polish families, Polish gender norms and traditions, Catholicism, and even are seen as threatening Polishness itself. Framed on par with historic traumatic events and threats at sovereignty such as Nazi German occupation and Soviet state socialism, gender, gender ideology was articulated in 2013 by Bishop Tadeusz Pieronek as, in his words, worse than communism and Nazism put together. As a threat to national sovereignty and Polishness, LGBTQ people in Poland are thus understood as dangerous bodies with dangerous ideas. Further still, gender ideology suggests that some people themselves and specifically LGBTQ bodies are in and of themselves an ideology rather than embodied persons and citizens with human rights. For example, take this banner from the 75th anniversary of the Warsaw Uprising. So just for context, for people who um, maybe don't know much about Polish history, the Warsaw Uprising was a really significant event in Polish sovereignty. It claimed um, upwards of 200,000 lives of civilians and resistance fighters, um, and really was is commemorated as an important event, but often weaponized as well by the right wing in recent years. On a banner from this commemorative parade, three symbols are rendered on parallel with each other, as you'll see. First, the sickle and hammer, symbolizing Soviet state socialist oppression. Next, the German swastika, referencing the Nazi regime. And then finally, the colors of the pride flag, symbolizing LGBTQ people and so-called gender ideology. Resident with Bishop Pieromik's words that gender ideology is worse than communism and Nazism put together, this banner presents LGBTQ people as actually deadly to Polish people, as occupiers of Polish spaces, and as a target that must be removed for Polishness to survive intact. Related to the above discourses that equate LGBTQ rights with people and people with foreign occupation, so-called LGBT free zones, known in Polish as strefy wolne od LGBT, started cropping up in 2019. The zones fueled by the Peace Party started appearing in response to Warsaw's liberal mayor, Rafał Trzaskowski, having signed a declaration in support of LGBTQ rights and in favor of including LGBTQ context in sexual education in the city. The zones act to create spaces within municipalities and regions in Poland that bar gender ideology and LGBTQ people. Up to one third of Poland, and this is kind of the eastern southern um, part of Poland, as you can see on the map, declared itself an LGBT free zone as of June 2020, with the European Union denying funding to zones that have declared themselves in this way. LGBT free zones are intended to create spaces where LGBTQ people cannot be visible and open, and indeed are not welcome to enter. While mostly symbolic rather than legal in function, these zones explicitly demarcate some Polish spaces as not for LGBTQ people, with the goal of again protecting the purity of Polish nationhood from the perceived negative influences and threats of gender ideology and LGBTQ bodies and eliminating queers from the visual landscape of the country. When all else fails, Polish right-wing populism is quick to jump on the bandwagon of pole exit, as maybe many of you have been following, arguing for a separation from Europe akin to Brexit, despite massive protests and the verbal protests of even Polish liberty fighters of the Warsaw Uprising, who are so often exploited as symbols of a true Poland that is supposedly and falsely gay and feminist free. So you might have seen this brilliant event from a few days ago. So refusing to be consumed as a symbol of a retrograde Poland, Polish war veteran and survivor of the Warsaw Uprising, Wanda Traczyk Stawsko, Ksywo or nicknamed Ponczek, which means donut, spoke truth to power, addressing right-wing Robert Bonkiewicz, who was a former leader of the National Radical Camp, which is a fascist, far-right, ultra-nationalist Polish organization. She said, be silent, stupid boy, be silent, you jerk. I am a soldier who remembers how Polish blood spilled, how my friends were slaughtered. This is our place, which no one gifted to us, where we have been for always. 
we fought for Poland and we fought for Europe. So basically she's putting together this argument really beautifully and very compellingly for Poland's place in Europe as one that was fought for by Poland and over which she actually spilled her blood and her, her friend's bloods were spilled as well. Unfortunately, the right-wing media immediately took to blemishing her image, saying that as an older person, she was no longer in the right mind. So in combination, understandings of LGBTQ people as espousing gender ideology, the creation of LGBT free zones, efforts at outlawing, outlawing pride parades and rising poll exit efforts, all signal really deep homophobic and transphobic sentiment in Poland. That the right aligns itself with hatred towards LGBTQ people, I believe is not incidental, but tied directly to nationalism and religiosity, as well to ideas of what I'll explore as melancholic nationalism. In a broad sense, Polish people have experienced centuries of trauma. Many Polish generations, mine included, have been raised on the legacies of this pain through intergenerational trauma. So again, for folks who might not um, have, be familiar with Polish history really briefly, Poland survived a 150 year period of colonization by Russia, the Austro-Hungarian Empire and Prussia, during which it was wiped off the map. During this period, Polish nationhood uh, survived without statehood, with Polish language forbidden in schools and Polish histories and traditions suppressed by institutions. In the 20th century, shortly after regaining sovereignty in 1918, Poland faced renewed occupation from Nazi Germany, as well as the genocide of Jewish people during the Second World War, and then right after Soviet occupation during the state socialist era. During both of these regimes, Polish people were murdered, brutalized, raped, and famined by the millions, and once again forced to suppress Polish culture. Through these oppressive regimes, and especially during state socialism, the Catholic Church emerged as a key pillar of Polishness adding comfort and guidance to an oppressed people and forming a space of political dissent against external occupation, serving as what David Herbert calls both the institutional and symbolic center of independent Polish national identity. And I think this is really unique for Poland and other Eastern European countries and Central Eastern European countries because there is this moment when um, religion protected Polish independence and Polish humanity, which is uh, different how it's being weaponized currently. In recent decades, this collective trauma has been, as I mentioned, weaponized or utilized by the right wing to frame Polish people as perpetually innocent of anti-Semitism and racism and LGBTQ people and feminists as the new totalitarianism that must be quashed for Polish sovereignty to survive intact. The Peace Party formed in 2001 has shifted since its inception from a center right to radical right party centering in its rhetoric a commitment to a nationalist Catholic Polish identity grounded in taking on the Western powers and marginalizing those deemed as threats to Polish security, including LGBTQ people and migrants. For example, in the 2015 Polish parliamentary election, PiS used its platform to oppose the acceptance of 7,000 migrants using what Artur Lipinski and Agnieszka Stępinska call victim perpetrator reversals, us them dichotomy, equating refugees with terrorists. More recently, in the 2020 presidential election run narrowly by peace, elected Andrzej Duda actively framed LGBTQ people as an ideology rather than as people. Often drawing on histories of struggle against occupation, on resistance efforts during World War II and state socialism and on solidarity movement activism, right-wing politicians function as what Elisabetta Goffman calls memory entrepreneurs who can manipulate traumatic memories in a population to justify the subversion of democratic processes, which is particularly dangerous. Far-right Polish nationalists routinely frame queer, transgender, and feminist citizens, alongside migrants from Eastern European and Muslim-majority countries, as a new wave of enemies and would-be occupiers within Poland's borders, evoking historical Polish traumas and the political theater of mourning to build hatred towards these groups. In this context, queerness is too often framed as new, as a Western import, as an unpatriotic, and as immoral. Eva Ponowska Jarek, drawing on Freud's formulation of melancholia, writes that Polish melancholic nationalism consists of an inability to move past historical grief, loss, and trauma, and it's a response to grief and trauma experienced within and by a nation. As such, Polish nationalism surfaces through narratives of Polish suffering under what Jarek identifies as a compensatory paradigm of Polish nationality, 
associated with the topos of messianic suffering. An analysis of this persistent obsession with innocence and redemptive suffering, as Jarek calls it, helps unravel the logic behind the right-wing formulation of Polish harm and violence as itself innocent, or how it's perceived to be innocent. Arguably, never having received the reparations that were Poland's due, Polish nationalists and right-leaning citizens have lingered in an injured frame, persistent in seeking a writing for the wrongs done, while unable also to recognize how this melancholia has been expressed in hateful and harmful ways to compensate for loss and injury. Attachment to Polishness as always under attack and always suffering directly stems out of unresolved national trauma that takes form in a collective melancholia. Polishness as, Jarek calls it, as a national paradigm of innocent suffering emboldens right-wing nationalist leaders and everyday citizens to assume that they are innocent of hatred and violence even while committing homophobic and transphobic actions leveled at the exclusion, expulsion, expulsion and erasure of LGBTQ bodies. What is more, this homophobia and transphobia is framed as in service of protecting the Polish nation toward the centuries long goal of sovereignty without external colonization or foreign occupation. This double move to protect Polish sovereignty by attacking LGBTQ people and to the protect the very right to attack through gesturing to national innocence characterizes some of the psychology behind Polish homophobia and transphobia. So moving on to the very last portion of this talk, with melancholic nationalism fueling hateful responses to LGBTQ people in Poland, symbols such as Rainbow Mary become endowed with threatening qualities. Rather than being seen as a remaking of Polish national icons for a new age, symbols such as Rainbow Mary become framed as hateful in themselves. This is also true of the remaking of other national symbols by queer and feminist protesters in recent years. And I'll show you just two examples of this. One example is the remaking of the P anchor symbol of fighting Poland, Polska Walcząca, into Polish women fighting, Polki Walcząca or Polka Walcząca by feminists, which was also framed by right-wing nationalists as insulting Poland and its national symbols, with some of its creators being put on trial for profanity against national symbols for 2016. So for context, the P anchor symbol of fighting Poland was used by the underground Polish state and home army, Armia Krajowa, during World War II to represent the fight against Nazi German occupation. The feminist renewal of the symbol transforms the anchor into a set of breasts, drawing connections between past national struggles and present day feminist struggles for liberation. Similarly, the draping of pride flags on national monuments by Korean feminist activists draws on protests from the state uh, for, from the solidarity movement and before when um, red paint was, um, was, uh, was being poured over sculptures of figures like Stalin as a protest to their uh, presence in public space. And I have one more example here. The remaking of the Polidar uh, Polish solidarity sign itself, which is Solidarność, into a feminist pro-choice rallying cry, Wypierdalać or fuck off, by feminists more recently, these have also been met with disapproval from the right, who are so ardent to protect national symbols at any and all cost. So I'll just say really briefly that I find these symbols so energizing and I think they draw on a tradition of protest, even though it's been hard for some folks, especially uh, right-leaning people to see it as really reviving these symbols and drawing on traditions of protest that are so central to Polishness in the first place. Podleśna created Rainbow Mary with the idea that the Holy Mother would protect LGBTQ persons, though Rainbow Mary was framed by the right as fundamentally violating a Polish Catholic symbol of sovereignty. As Jennifer Ram argues, feminist and queer remakings of national and religious symbols in Poland, such as Rainbow Mary, are misread as attacking Polish patriotism when they in fact can be best understood as efforts to remake patriotism so that it is more inclusive of women and LGBTQ people. More so than patriotic, I understand this remaking of national and religious Polish symbology through what Jose Esteban Munoz describes as disidentification. An LGBTQ remaking of mainstream symbols so that they can better serve and include LGBTQ people. Through disidentification, the remaking of national symbols allows for a positive recognition of national or collective melancholia 
and the possibility for pre preventing the deployment of hatred through melancholic nationalism. As Jadik writes, it is only by acknowledging this unconscious threat of melancholic nationalism and by traversing the destructive fantasy that promises to protect us against it, that contemporary Poland stands a chance of inventing new, more ethical modes of collectivity and solidarity, no longer predicated on the narcissistic investment in its own suffering, but more concerned with the responsibility for the suffering of others. Symbolic reinvention such as that of Rainbow Mary partakes in such inventing of new, more ethical modes of collectivity and solidarity, demanding Polish accountability while building community amongst LGBTQ Polish folks. Writing on Latinx performance art, Munoz frames this identification as the process by which the artist reformulates a given object, event, or moment that originally functioned to exclude or wound in order to, in his words, make a rich anti-normative anti treasure trove of queer possibility. Podleśna's Rainbow Mary does exactly the work of disidentification, operating from within the visual code of Polish symbology of oppression and national struggle, while recentering the minoritarian queer perspective as someone excluded from these national narratives. Polish melancholic nationalism becomes attached to cultural objects such as the Black Madonna of Częstochowa painting, speaking to one of Polishness as a site of, per which speak to an, uh, of Polishness as a site of perpetual suffering and unresolved grief of generations. Under understanding this weight of meaning, Podleśna's remaking of that painting works on and with this cultural and national symbol to express queer minoritarian Polish subjecthood. Podleśna undertakes the work of transforming a national symbol so that it openly speaks to violence against LGBTQ people and argues for their inclusion in the national frame. As Munoz articulates, like a melancholic subject holding onto a lost object, a disidentificatory subject works to hold onto this object and invest it with new life. In just this way, Podleśna holds on to the Black Madonna of Częstochowa as a symbol of Polishness and holds it dear, while also remaking it in such a way that it can provide shelter for LGBTQ folks it is made to exclude. The new image Rainbow Mary emerges as a survival strategy the minority subject practices in order to negotiate a phobic majoritarian public sphere that continuously elides or punishes the existence of subjects who do not conform to the phantasm of normative citizenship. Those are Munoz's words. LGBTQ people in Poland, explicitly and violently excluded from the right to be in public spaces, the right to be with each other, to gather in love, and to have epistemological agency in the world, are refashioned in Podleśna's work as at the very heart of Polishness, at the very center of Polish survival and sovereignty. Podleśna's art has produced a new, even utopian vision for LGBTQ inclusion at the very heart of Polishness. This in turn creates space for a positive identification of melancholia that holds both grief and hope together. Disidentificatory melancholia emerges here in Podleśna's work and other Polish protest art, as the ones I've mentioned, that reworks national symbols to carve out queer and feminist spaces to both sit with centuries of oppression and, and also to disidentify with the weaponization of oppression through nationalist calls to hate. Rather than rejecting the original painting, as many have accused Podleśna of doing, she didn't actually vandalize it. She just took a photocopy of it and drew on it. Rainbow Mary is the loving remaking of the national maternal symbol to include LGBTQ people, asking us to rethink sovereignty and legacies of trauma from a distinctly queer Polish perspective. Rainbow Mary remakes a cultural field from the perspective of a minority subject, as Munoz frames it, someone who is disempowered previously in such a representational hierarchy. Through disidentification, the new image created rides on the edge of pain and inter intergenerational trauma that haunts Polishness, while also interrogating the ways in which collective pain has been weaponized towards nationalist models of hurt and exclusion. Disidentificatory melancholia surfaces here as a strategy of coping, of love and of hope, a way forward in seeing LGBTQ people included and celebrated within Polish nationhood. And um, that is all. Thank you, Jin Kuyo. And I, I, I think we have at least 20 minutes for questions. So I'm very excited about that.
Thank you so much. That was a wonderful talk. Um, so yes, we have some time for questions. So I'd like to encourage people to just feel free to use the question and answer chat function at the bottom of the screen. And I see we do have a question already, um, if I can pose that to you. So um, this question comes from Jeff Sires, and he says, what has the EU done, if anything, to help Polish citizens in provinces and states which have been claimed to be LGBT Q free zones? Yeah, so I think this is um, a complex question because so first of all, I guess the EU sees itself as helping by removing funding from this area, from those areas. So um, there has been, and I think this is one of the things that's also driving poll exit is this kind of removing of funding from LGBT uh, free, free areas or areas that declare themselves as such in order to um, basically discourage um, this kind of uh, space to even exist. Um, there's also been, I think a lot of, because of um, the EU, because of the way that people now move from Poland to other countries, there's been lots of solidarity work from other countries too. Like lots of people from Germany will come to the various um, pride parades and other events in Poland. So there is lots of solidarity in that way. The other thing I think that's important is that um, like, I think, uh, the part of the, the Polishness behind LGBTQ resistance is really important in the context of Poland. So I think um, sometimes when other countries get involved uh, with countries that are seen like as the edge at the edges of empire or formerly colonized countries, it can take on very kind of insulting roles potentially. Um, and so ironically, this is a moment where the right wing and the left wing might actually agree because if the answer isn't really to have uh, solutions from like Western, Western countries be imposed into uh, Polish context or into other countries really, but it is to kind of just have that support, which um, I don't think the EU has fully figured out how to do, I mean, other than removing that funding in the first place, which has been, of course, lots of damage, very damaging for, to many communities, um, but also, you know, rightfully, um, rightfully placed given the hatred that's taking place. Yes, thank you so much. Yes, and I, I think that was actually covered in the CBC not that long ago. Some of you might be familiar with that story um, about the pulling of, I think it was a UNESCO grant or um, some other ground that was about um, one of the regions that had imposed one of those zones. So I don't see any other questions. So I do have a question myself, which is about um, how this kind of activism uh, relates to um, other issues of repression. And I'm thinking here around sort of the monopoly of state ideology over history, the Holocaust law that criminalizes any mention of Polish complicity um, with the Nazis. So I'm just sort of curious about how that, if that's part of um, some of the activism too, I'm thinking especially about how the gay community was singled out as victims by the Nazi regime. And um, so I'm wondering, you know, there's a kind of double trauma there, right? The way the Poles were victimized um, aggressively um, when they were occupied by the Nazis, but then again, um, gay poles and how they would have been treated would have been another factor. So I'm just curious as if there's been any sort of engagement with that particular history. Yeah, definitely. And again, I'm not so, um, I'm fairly new to, to research on Poland. I mean, it's something I've been, been doing, wanting to do for a long time, but it's sometimes been hard to kind of find the ways to talk about that. Um, Jarek, that article I've been mentioning, it, actually it's a chapter, actually the way she develops that framework for melancholic nationalism is through looking at um, Polish, um, a Polish refusal to mourn Jewish deaths. And although this isn't true of everywhere and everyone, there is this way in which like, um, there has been this, in many cases, lack of accountability around that, um, you know, with like Jewish cemeteries falling into disrepair in Poland, for example, that's one example she looks at, or not even lack of knowledge around where um, Jewish cemeteries were located, um, because the focus had been after the war so much on, um, on focusing on Polish loss uh, at the expense of also looking at Polish Jewish loss. So I think it's like, it's such a major tension and um, it, it gets people really frustrated because on one side, uh, the feeling is that Polish folks, uh, the, the loss of um, Polish lives hasn't been recognized. But on the other hand, the way that Polish lives are theorized doesn't always leave space for Polish Jewish lives, which is really at the heart of who, who can count as grievable in the first place. So there's lots of really co like complex things there. And of course, it's a central 
um, point of dissent and in, in the Polish context, especially with the right wing being so strong on the side of um, wanting to only focus on Polish loss and not having space to think about other loss as well or how Polish loss intersects with other forms of loss. Um, so yeah, it's I, I think it's a very, um, one of the central things that the right wing is kind of rallying against um, in its attempt to uh, hold Polishness to um, kind of that, that innocent um, paradigm of suffering. That, that's a huge part of it. A list of resources. Yes, I have, um, I have one I can copy and paste for sure. So these are uh, mostly academic articles, but they're all, are also um, news articles and there's so many now. So this is not a complete list. I'm going to put it in the chat and maybe someone can, um, maybe, no, maybe I can get it. No, I don't think I can get it into a q and I'll put it in the chat and um, maybe one other person can then. Oh, I see. There is this thing where it's hard to copy and paste from here. So I think um, the best way to do this then maybe there, there's this weird um, feature in the chat where you can't always copy and paste from a Word doc. So, but I'm happy to share this information afterwards. I can send it and um, maybe there's a way to send it to participants. What do you think, Terry? That is a great idea, yes. Okay, we will do and, that. Yeah, and Dr. Shibuo's uh, website is very easy to find as well. So I recommend that you direct yourself to that as well and all her articles and, and I assume the references in your articles are gonna be there as well um, for further reading. Definitely. And there's like so many, you know, the last 10 years or the last 15 years, there's been so much work done on this. And I don't, I definitely don't want to make it suggest like I'm doing things that are entirely new with what I'm saying. Like this is very much a personally invested navigation that I do, but there's so many brilliant feminists in Poland. Um, Agnieszka Graf, um, uh, um, Grabowska. Um, there's just, yeah, there's a lot of incredible work. Those are just two names that, that are very um, central for, for me, but um, there really has been a lot of discussion, both in popular kind of news media context and also in academic work. Great. And we also have another question um, from Ben St. Dennis. I realize it's not really a question, but I think the question of diaspora is an important one. Mm -hmm. And Finn asks, what would you suggest for those of us who are part of the Polish diaspora in Canada who are interested in supporting this activism? Um, you know, I wish we were in person so that we could ask people who here is Polish or has a Polish connection, like I have a Polish grandmother. And, um, and I feel like um, that's really important. Like how is the diaspora taking up these issues? Like to what extent are they involved and how can they be involved? Yeah, so the first thing I would recommend is um, the Facebook page Polonia Inclusive um, is a great site if you're not already on there. Um, the other thing is, so my experience of growing up in a diaspora is that I think Polonia, you know, as in P Polishness beyond Polish borders, too often tends to be extra conservative. Um, and I don't know if this is, if other people have found this to be true as well, but there's this sort of like, especially with the solidarity wave of immigration, there's the sense of wanting to hold on to Polishness at all costs. And oftentimes that sense of Polishness is kind of frozen in time in a different era, which makes sense because that's, you know, that's when families or, or individuals left. Um, and there's an attachment to not only Poland as a nation, but also the memory of your Poland, the, the experience you had, the life you had before you were through political circumstances forced to, to leave. So of course that's really complex to begin with. Um, I would say the most meaningful thing for me has been seeing that other people also care. So um, for example, um, Sylvia who invited me to do this talk, um, uh, is part of also Polonia Inclusive. And there's a lot of other people in Edmonton specifically who are too, um, and they organized also, um, there was a march organized, I think in like, I wanna say March of last year for, um, to protest the abortion laws. Um, so, you know, and things like that have been cropping up like in Toronto and in other places. The other thing that's really important is that because of um, how difficult it is for queer people to live in Poland, but also how poorly paid a lot of jobs are in Poland. Uh, Polish diaspora has grown tremendously in the last uh, you know, 20 years or since the EU especially has gone into effect. And so now there's 
the Polish diaspora, you know, is so varied. Like there's lots of queer Polish communities in like places like the UK um, or in, you know, other European countries just because of the sheer number of people that have left or are leaving because of um, the homophobia and transphobia. So, you know, I think um, the other hard thing is the question that you mentioned of like language and the question of, do I have a right to be part of this community? And I think every diasporic person navigates that to some extent, like, is this, uh, you know, if I wasn't born in Poland, or if I left as a young child, or if my parents were Polish, do I have actually, do I have a right to this community? And I think every person has to make sense of that for themselves. And I think the question of being in conversation and in relation with, with communities is really the way to do it. Um, there's also a book I would recommend that I really like that's helped me navigate some of these questions too. Um, Swimming in the Dark by Jerzy Jędrowski. It's a book written by, uh, it's a queer coming of age story that's written by someone who um, was born, I think, in Poland, but grew up in Western Germany. Um, but, and like, you know, speaks multiple languages, but whenever he goes to Poland, he's made to feel like he doesn't belong there. And maybe some other of you folks who have accents in Polish have also had similar experiences with Polish people being really mean and saying things like, you're not from here, or like, sometimes racialized things like, are you Ukrainian? Or like, you know, just whatever. Um, so it is really, I think, important to like, you know, understand that protection of Polishness as, as both violent and as grounded in like historical trauma and, but also not put up with it. You know, if you identify as Polish, if you um, are, feel like you're in communication with um, other people who are Polish, with families, with tradition, with your family, with traditions, um, you know, it can always be renewed. I think this is the amazing thing of living in diaspora is that you can always read something new. You can always um, try to access new literature, watch new videos. And this is made so possible with social media. And um, the part that I didn't talk about a lot in the talk is how social media enables me really to feel like I um, am involved in, in the work that's happening in Poland, even though of course in reality I'm not, because I'm able to in real time follow the protests, understand what is going on and have representation that isn't only right-wing media, which, what you, which is what used to happen before with the way that um, TV satellites like worked in, in um, you know, places like Canada, like you wouldn't have access in the, for the most part to, um, you would have access to a few channels usually with right-wing news. So now there's just so much more that we can tap into to get us um, anchored and, um, and connected and to make us feel empowered to, to seek out those parts of ourselves, even if they feel, if it feels like they've been dormant or hidden for a while. And there is not quite a question, but just a sort of um, call for clarification about whether Elizabeth uh, Podleshna was um, whether she's out of jail now. And I believe, I think he said she was, but is she facing more jail time or? No, so she wasn't, she was, although she was jailed, I, I don't remember the details, but it wasn't for very long. Um, it was more of a s symbolic and obviously very frustrating attempt. Then she had two years of court cases in which, uh, and she won those, as I mentioned, she was acquitted with the other two activists of all charges, which was a huge victory. Basically the judge deemed that she had, so there is this um, uh, like, uh, um, law in Poland that basically says you can't vandalize Polish national or religious symbols, right? And that's what was used against her. Um, but she did, she was found to have not actually vandalized anything because number one, she didn't actually vandalize the painting that's like, you know, highly secured in a, in, in, in a church in Częstochowa and not easily accessible. Um, she only, you know, took a copy of it and like basically did some collaging work with it. Like, you know, reinventing the symbol, but actually not damaging the thing itself. But also it was, um, as I mentioned uh, during her acquittal, it was deemed that there's actually nothing hateful about putting some rainbows on Mother Mary. Like she didn't say there's no hateful information in there. There was only just the suggestion of a rainbow that represents LGBTQ. So the fact that this originally that this was deemed as basically hate speech or that it was deemed as hurtful to national symbols is in itself kind of absurd. As the one meme I showed, rainbows are kind of a thing for, um, you know, various religious symbology, like the rainbow might symbolize LGBTQ things, but it's also 
from what I understand, a thing in Catholicism, like you'll see lots of rainbows in places. So it was totally absurd to even suggest that there was anything hateful in her remaking of the symbol or that it in any way tarnished it. Um, and I mean, I would say the same thing is true though of those other symbols I looked at, like um, Polka Varchonsa with the, the P anchor symbol with the breasts drawn in. Like, why is it that we're finding exposed breasts suddenly offensive or damaging to national symbols? That makes no sense. Like Polish films and media and magazines are always showing off breasts. Like this is not a thing that's censored in Poland at all. And also, what is it about a chest that is re read as belonging to um, someone who's understood as a woman that is offensive in the first place? Again, it just like ties into all these ways that, you know, on the one hand, Poland is matriarchal, on the other hand, it's um, deeply sexist and misogynist. On the one hand, it claims love for all and develops uh, substantial welfare programs for poor people. On the other hand, you know, it seems to really hate refugees and LGBTQ people. And it's just all these like really existential, quandary, existential quandaries that I think Polish people and the government and the nation state is working through. And unfortunately with um, a, a very, a, what has become basically a radical right-wing leadership, it has become, um, uh, you know, to the, to the detriment of various minorities, including queer people, migrants, people of different ethnicities or different racializations in Poland, et cetera. Okay, we have another uh, question, this time from Sylvia. I'll just read it out. Um, Do you see hope in political movements in Poland, such as the newly formed party Spring, uh, launched by Robert Biedron, who is himself openly gay and a very visible and active member of the LGBTQ plus community in Poland. Yeah, definitely. And again, like through social media, you know, we can follow these people. Like I follow Biedroni on Instagram and I can, you know, it's so um, wonderful to see that. At the same time, it's like, it's really hard because it feels like with uh, within queer studies, um, we, you know, so many of the discussions have been, especially in Western context, critiques of Western liberal models. But unfortunately, it seems that um, in a context like Poland, um, what maybe like Western liberalism is something that needs to be implemented. On the other hand, there's been really excellent work as well, challenging the temporality of, um, of queer movements. And there's been like the suggestion that too often Western LGBTQ movements are imposed as models onto other contexts. So that context, so the idea that like, you know, um, there was a fight for rights in a, a context like US, now gay people can uh, marry, um, have children, um, you know, and that the decades of oppression are sort of over. And of course that's not true too, because I think the other thing that's important is that this kind of populism also exists in the US. And as we saw, of course, there's a lot of those things are tra uh, transnational, even if there are specific Polish contexts. So um, I definitely think though that the presence of trans and gay identifying politicians um, is super important and also super brave because this is a, again, the, the hatred, the vitriol that's aimed at queer and trans people in Poland right now, it's like hard for us to imagine in Western context, even though of course lots of people face it here too. But it's, um, you know, it's, it is quite dangerous, I think, to be out, even though people challenge that on a daily basis. And lots of people, of course, organize and uh, are visibly, make efforts to be visibly queer and queer identified in order to challenge the hatred. On that topic, I was wondering too, and I know we just have a couple of minutes left, but one of the things I was really struck by with the image of the rainbow Madonna is the reverence that's there. Like, as you exactly said, there is no sort of dis uh, destruction of the image or disrespect. Um, there's, it's so respectful. It's all about that kind of shared uh, consciousness, shared suffering, the place of everybody and inclusion. Like for me, it was, it was just striking, you know, just how she retains the gravitas of the image and the symbology of that. So that's just a kind of comment. And I, I do have one more question just before we wrap up here um, from Agnieszka, which is, have you had the opportunity to offer your insights and in teaching at educational institutions in Poland? Do you have any other webinars coming up? We'd be very interested. Um, and, and then another question about um, possible ways of um, supporting um, LGBTQ2 um, Spirit Plus community in Poland. So quite a quite a lot to pack in. We just have, um, does the talk run till two or till two? 
after two. I believe it just ends at two. So if, if, if you would like to take those on. Yeah, for sure. So, so much to unpack, but um, so I have actually recently done a talk in Warsaw, but it was on, uh, of course, over Zoom on asexuality, um, which is one of the areas I mostly work on. The thing is that, you know, as someone who's um, not currently in Poland, um, I don't think it's really fair for me to come into spaces in Poland and kind of um, necessarily, I mean, I can, if I was invited, of course, I'd, I'd, that would be uh, great. But for the most part, I think because of my positionality as a US academic, that puts me in a specific relation to like power. Um, I have, I probably earn more money than most academics in Poland. Um, I have access to more opportunities probably in certain ways. And it's just, it would be a weird relationship for me to um, talk about something that uh, I'm removed from. So I think there's like weird politics of positionality there. Um, so in answer to your thing, um, yes and no, I think, because I did that talk on asexuality, but also less so on this content. And then, the, but hi Agnieszka also, thanks for coming. Um, and also for the second question, um, yes, there are top three raised organizations in Canada can support LGBTQ folks in Poland. Okay, so I think number one would be education, reading news media articles. Unfortunately, what happens a lot is that um, uh, folks in Canada and the US are not always well informed on things that are happening in other parts of the world. So I think reading some of the articles um, online can be really helpful. Number two, I think that Polonia inclusive group is I think I, I would suggest as well, as well as really Instagram. Instagram and Twitter um, have so many wonderful um, groups to follow. And once you tap into one of them, you can kind of collect, connect to the others. So Polonia Inclusive, for example, is a great way to start. Um, there's Campania Przeciw Homophobii, Campaign Against Homophobia. There's um, Transfusia, Transfusion, a trans organization. There's just so many things that I can't even mention. Um, and then um, number three, I think, Hmm. I don't know if I have a number three right now. I'm really sorry. Um, but yeah, these are all really uh, great questions and I wish I had more time to talk. This has been so wonderful. Okay, so on that note, I think we need to conclude the talk today. Thank you so much, um, Ella. That was wonderful. Um, and thank you to the audience and for the wonderful questions. And um, please don't forget to check out um, our future events at the Worth Institute. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you.